The International Parking Mobility Institute is pleased to present this webinar titled, A New Approach Can Help Cities Measure and Solve Cruising for Parking. My name is Kenny and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. If you need assistance at any time during the program, please raise your hand or use the chat feature and we will assist you. Today's presentation will last 60 minutes and will include a specific question and answer period. However, if you can queue up uh, a question for us at any time during today's presentation. To enter a question to the webinar system, simply click the Q&A tab or the chat and type your question and press enter. All registered participants will receive an archived version of this presentation in a few days. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker and team, Alan Greenberg, Senior Policy Analyst at the Federal Highway Administration. Alan and team, welcome to the program. The audience is all yours. Delighted and uh, special thanks to IPMI, a group that's really just been wonderful and thinking about parking broadly and larger mobility system and really uh, open to learning and a lot of important work. So th thank you, uh, Kenny. Um, this is uh, our uh, second presentation. We made one on a similar uh, subject, but this one's got a bit of a different focus at the uh, Transportation Research Board annual meeting of researchers in DC just last month. Uh, the title is A New Approach uh, Can Help Cities Measure and Solve Cruising for Parking. And that's, that's an ambitious goal, but that is the goal that we set uh, before us. Next slide. Uh, the work is uh, sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration, part of the US Department of Transportation. Uh, and that is our uh, standard disclaimer. I'll leave it up. Um, let me introduce the team. I'm gonna start with uh, the two presenters uh, and then uh, the others uh, after that. Uh, we're joined, uh, the main presenter will be Dr. Rachel Weinberger. She's the Peter Herman Chair of the Regional Planning Association, founding principal of her own firm. Uh, she has over 30 years of transportation planning experience in the public and private sectors and in academia. She's an internationally recognized expert in sustainable transportation with specialization in travel behavior, land use, transportation interactions, economic impacts of transportation systems, and of course, policy. Um, the second presenter will be Dr. Taya Tayo Lucio. Uh, he is a research faculty member at the Transportation Research Institute at the University of Michigan. His research interests are urban systems and operations research, specifically designing and implementing initiatives for sustainable and resilient communities with a focus on efficiency and innovation. Before he joined the uh, faculty at the University of Michigan, Dr. Tayo was an adjunct economic faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University, which happens to also be the alma mater, uh, where he received his PhD in engineering and public policy. Uh, also with us will be uh, Ellis Calvin. He doesn't have a speaking role except at the end where he is going to be monitoring very closely the chat going on. And we do welcome people to uh, put in any issue they may uh, want to have addressed. Uh, Ellis is a data research manager and senior planner at the Regional Plan Association, system organization. Rachel, her work includes a wide range of cross cutting research and analysis from ecological adaptation to climate change, long term land use and transportation changes brought about by COVID 19. She's a member of the adjunct faculty of the New Jersey Institute of Technology and has a master's in urban planning. So those, are the, those are the folks that you will be seeing. I also want to acknowledge uh, a few others uh, who've been involved or are still involved. Uh, Michelle Neumer uh, is um, with us. She is a project manager, manager at Lidos, and there's a lot of moving parts in the work that gets done, and Michelle manages it very, very well, and plus she's a transportation expert in her own, uh, on her own right with 20 one years of experience. Transportation engineering projects have a whole range of issues. Also on the team, but not joining us, uh, are um, Dr. Um, Dr. Adam Alug Ball. He's an associate professor of urban region planning at UCLA, and uh, uh, also uh, Dr. Robert Hampshire. He uh, was uh, with. Uh, Dr. Fabricio, actually, they worked together quite extensively, both at Carnegie Mellon and then at University of Michigan. But his current role is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology and the Chief Science Officer at all of the USDOT. So, 
the fact that he was uh, actually the leader on this project uh, is very rare and odd a thing that someone that high up not only sort of understands it, but maybe understands it a lot better than some of those. So, so, a lot. so it's, it's really, a, it, this is a team to, uh, of teams, really. It's, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful group. And I've, I've been so fortunate to be able to work with everybody. Uh, so uh, next slide. Kenny, I think uh, that's you. Hi, everybody. Yes, please take some time to answer the following IPMI audience check-in. Tell us about yourself. Are you representing? Who are you representing, I should say? We like to know who we're reaching. I, I, I know that IPMI has a, a very broad membership. And uh, so thank you for that. And those are Very interesting results. And we have a second poll as well. Is reducing parking cruising a specific management objective? <clears throat> And you forgot the uh, response is not yet, but I'm sure it will be after this presentation. Impressive. Right, there you go. Great. Let's see. All right, so uh, you all get to see where you fit in that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna just uh, give a, a single slide at this point on, on just what uh, the Federal Highway Administration is doing, supporting research and development of tools like, like this. And then I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Rachel to start the uh, technical presentation, Rachel and then uh, Io as well. Uh, okay, so this is uh, probably one of the most common things that people have seen if they've looked at the issue of parking crews. And that is the figure that 30% of uh, traffic in general, is uh, cruising traffic in cities. That's what the perceived uh, reality is. It came from uh, research that uh, the guru of parking research, Dr. Donald Shoup, um, put in a book and some earlier papers that summarize a whole range of studies that look specifically at this. The studies took place over many years. Uh, they occurred where there was a thought that there was a problem. That's why the issue was studied. And some of the study methodologies were better than others. And they just sort of took the results and averaged it. Now, Dr. Shoup doesn't sort of use this figure, but it's often commonly used. And I think it's misused um, because we don't really know. And that's kind of what the issue is. So we supported, we, we, we did think there was a problem though. So we said, well, are we able to reduce it regardless of whether this number is precisely here or not? So the Federal Highway Administration through the number of programs that uh, preeminent of them was the value pricing pilot program. We put some funding into some uh, local pilots. The biggest one by far was SF Park. We put in 19, a little over $19 million. It was the first big scale uh, effort where the meters uh, technology was improved so that the uh, prices could be changed quickly, remotely, and they were to be changed based on occupancy. Uh, Levels. There was a target occupancy, usually in the 60, 80% level at different times per block. And uh, so every six weeks or so, they would change the prices to try to hit that target occupancy, meaning they would lower the prices uh, if the parking was light, and they would raise the prices if it was reaching a point where you might be uh, having some availability issues and thus spurring some cruising. Um, so we did that. We uh, there were actually a bunch of teams that looked at the same data. Uh, some of the folks on this call were part of one team. Uh, Federal Highways supported its own research and the, the principal in San Francisco did, did some of their own. And, and bottom line is we all found actually similar reduction in cruising. We found that we could actually reduce it fairly substantially. But the surprising thing 
was that the actual rates of initial cruising that we got, depending on the measure methodology, is very, very different. And so we realized, okay, which is right? What do we know? What don't we know? And so the next question became, well, when and where is cruising really happening? Can we figure it out? Can we, because we, we, we learned we can make a difference, but we also learned it's not super easy to do this. We're, we're working to improve the technology and systems and we've been making it easier over time, but it's not a non-effort. So the first question is, is it worth it? And the more detailed question is, if it is worth it, where is it worth it? When is it worth it? Where is it really a, a big issue? Where is it most? And that's, that's what's behind uh, the, the research. So Rachel, uh, go to it. All right, <clears throat> welcome everybody. Really appreciate you all uh, coming out and making sure that I am not muted. Um, so uh, I'm gonna say once um, Federal Highways put out that challenge question. Uh, so, so the challenge came from, from USDOT um, about this. And so I, I put together, um, well, I didn't put together. So some colleagues of mine, most of whom are on this project as well, decided to, to take a look at, um, at the question and um, understand, see if we could understand or provide better guidance on, on where cruising um, is and at what time. And that's what we're gonna talk about here um, mostly today. So cruising is one of those things people think they know it when they see it. Um, many cities have encountered the issue that people are complaining there is insufficient parking, but there's insufficient parking on that particular block, but there's parking nearby. Um, it's overstated as an urban problem um, in terms of that 30% that Alan was just speaking about. Um, but it is definitely a serious problem where it is a problem. So our understanding has been um, very clouded by how we have studied it. So the big innovation that we um, have here today and the tools that we're presenting, and we're gonna present two tools, um, the, is that they are driven now by some GPS data that we were able to obtain. Um, so the first tool is GPS heavy um, for the user. And the second tool is GPS derivative for the, the time and, and, and place where GPS data are not particularly available. Um, and so the agenda for today really is to talk about cruising, what it is, where it's a problem, why it's a problem, the two tools. And then um, as Kenny said, there'll be time at the end for, for questions and answers. Again, for some reason, my slide's not advancing. So, um, so we actually have another question for you guys already right up. And that is, have you ever tried to estimate cruising for parking? And if you're, answer, if you're answering yes to this, um, if you would also just throw into the chat um, ways that you have attempted to do that. Okay, so a few of you have, um, and maybe you could give us some idea about how, how you did that. We'll come back around to that. So, okay, so the what and why of cruising for starters. So here's the what, right? It's been a vexing problem since the beginning of automobility, right? I say since we brought up the Model T. Um, uh, Shoup, who um, Alan mentioned before, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with, described searching for parking as akin to waiting in a queue of indeterminate length and being called at random. So the first studies of parking date back to the 1920s. So when we say since the advent of the Model T, it's not that much of an exaggeration. So then for clarity then in terms of the what, um, parking search is technically part of almost every automobile trip that is made. Unless you are ending the trip in a reserved parking space or in your driveway, I mean, even to the extent you, you know, you're going to, you're driving around in a parking lot, you're looking for a place to park. Whether it's easy or hard to find a parking space then becomes really the question, right? So when there's excess VMT, and some people might say wasted time, I'm less sensitive to the, to the time waste concern because as I indicated a moment ago, most of the time when you're looking for parking, 
there is in fact some parking close at hand. Not always the case, um, certainly in our larger, denser cities, it's harder, um, more on that coming up. But so, our, so usually when um, municipalities are trying to understand or neighborhoods, uh, what, the, what the cruising is, is they ask people if they're going somewhere or if they're looking for parking, right? And so the answer, the proportion of people that are gonna answer that they're looking for parking versus they are going somewhere um, depends to some extent on what is the character of the area. If it's a destination um, or a place people tend to pass through, you'll get different answers to that. And it doesn't actually reflect um, the number of people really who are looking for parking in any way other than that. So let me give a, a example. Um, one study I came across was restricted to residents of a neighborhood. And in that study, the, they found that 65% of people were looking for parking, which made a nice scare headline, but it doesn't provide good information and it doesn't really serve that well as a basis for making policy. And the reason that I say that is, if you ask somebody in the neighborhood where they live, whether they're going somewhere or whether they're looking for parking, 50% of them are going somewhere. I'm either coming back home or I'm leaving home, right? So, so we don't really know. So it, in theory, the baseline answer to that should be 50% of people are looking for parking. So, so these findings obviously need to be um, interpreted with great care. Other strategies that have been employed to identify cruising for parking, um, put people on bicycles and tell them to ride around until they find a spot train a video um, on a, a, you know, a camera on a block and look at, examine the video, see how many vehicles pass a space that's empty before somebody parks. Um, both of those strategies have very um, severe geographic limitations. So for this particular work, we came up then with two technical definitions of parking. Um, one is repeated blocks. So if we could find a trip where the driver traversed the same block multiple times, um, we would say that person is looking for parking. Um, and that person is actually looking in the way that we often talk about it, which is to say they're circling for parking. Um, but in another instance, and I'll show you an example of what I mean, um, we are um, looking at what is excess travel. And I'm sorry, but we're not advancing here. There we go. So here's an example. Um, so the, here, as I said at the, at the beginning, sort of the big innovation here is we have the GPS data. And in this particular illustration, we have the GPS breadcrumb and we can follow the path of the vehicle. So we don't actually know the destination, but we, uh, the person's destination, but we know the last place um, from which a location ping was emitted from their navigation device. So we assume that where they're going is near enough to where they parked. So, um, so what we've done then is we've defined, so in this illustration, the star is the indication of the last location that we have. And then from there, we backtrace to this circle um, and we indicate that as a 400 meter radius around where they ended the trip. And we assume their destination is somewhere in there. In this illustration also, you can see the pink line is the actual path that the vehicle traveled. So there's some circuity, there's a lot of length going on, trip ends there. And what we do then is we map the shortest path from entering that um, 400 meter radius to where they finally park. And then we compare the shortest path with the actual path taken. Um, so in, in this case, um, and then we added a threshold for, for technical reasons, which I can go into in Q&A if anybody's interested, um, not super important. Um, but we added an extra 200 meter threshold longer than the shortest path. And then we defined that um, as, as, a, as a cruising trip. So we have um, tangential research that I'll show you, um, which shows us that circling is not a good descriptor. Um, and this, you know, this is the shape of cruising um, a little bit. This is a shameless plug for a paper we recently wrote. It's called The Shape of Cruising, and it's in a journal called Transport Findings. And so far from the classic myth that cruising is circling for parking, um, you know, we find five dominant forms. So and here's just some illustrations from a sample of over 5,000 trips where we found um, some cases where it's circling, people are crossing over. 
Um, some cases where a driver just drives in a straight line and, and keeps going and looking. Another um, classic example is uh, the trip is characterized by making more right turns, more U-turns, and also left turns. So, so this was just kind of fun. I mean, here's some more examples of, of what cruising trips can actually look like. So why do people cruise? Generally, people cruise because they're hunting. They're hunting for a bargain. They don't want to pay at a meter. So a lot of the meter interventions, performance parking, which some of you are familiar with, and that's the example in San Francisco that Alan gave us, where the meter price is set at a market clearing price so that there's always some kind of availability. We see sometimes bypass that um, because they're looking for a bargain. Another reason, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to skip to my third bill that they might bypass that spot is maybe that's somebody who lives in the neighborhood and they're parking overnight or they're looking for two days to park. So parking at a meter doesn't suffice for them. Another reason that people cruise is proximity hunting, right? So they want to get as close as possible to their ultimate destination. And we have a social cultural expectation, a certain kind of entitlement. If we're driving, we should be able to park immediately right where it is that we're going. Um, whereas we think in terms of public transit, it's perfectly satisfactory if there's a bus stop five, within five minutes of your destination, or if it's rail, a train station could be within 10 minutes. But if you're, if you're parking, you need to be right there at the front door. And so that is a reason that people have um, for cruising. So we um, came up with this tool, getting to the tool. So we're looking for a clever name for it. We'll take any suggestions that folks have. Um, but right now we're calling it the GPS cruise detector. And I'm just going to run through the components of the system, talk about the data requirements and concerns that we've run up against and then talk a little bit about um, some of the policy issues that, that we can address. So very basically, um, we need input data to the system. We need to identify the trips. We match trips to a street network so that we can do the comparison I was talking about before. Um, so th then uh, we can develop some summary statistics and also some interesting maps to, to show what the analysis looks like. So for data requirements, we need a street, a street network, some background data like that. Um, we have used exclusively publicly available software. Um, part of our mission and agenda for this work is that it be accessible um, to as many people as possible, as, as, um, as inexpensively as possible. So we use QGIS, which is a, a competitor, I guess, to ArcGIS, which is the only commercial GIS program that I'm aware of, but um, publicly available. Um, we used OpenStreets data layers um, for our networks. There are a couple of other um, software components that, that come into play. Um, so, so we can let you know all of that information um, afterwards. Uh, the trip data are more complex. And so I'm gonna spend some time talking uh, about that um, now. So, there are basically three different kinds of trip data that we have been able to take advantage of. Um, the best um, data is disaggregated GPS traces. And we have that for the first part of the project. Um, you can get that from how some of the GPS equipped household travel surveys that MPOs do. Um, we used a commercial vendor um, for this project. There's three of them listed there, Streetlight, AirSage, and Inrex. Um, the problem that we've encountered more recently is as privacy protocols have increased, it is harder to get the disaggregate, perhaps, well, last time we tried, impossible to get disaggregated trip data. And so what we did for this piece of the project um, is we used a data compiler who gave us results in an aggregated fashion. So, so sort of tuck that away in your back pocket and I'll come back around to it and, and you'll understand um, why it matters and why it's important, what you can and can't do. So then the other, the third um, data possibility is location data um, from which you could try to infer uh, what is a trip. And again, I'll get into to more details with that. Um, and ag again, changing data protocols introduce certain complications. Um, we used a particular provider and earlier on the trip data was of better quality because they harvest location data from apps 
And it used to be the case that apps would be constantly streaming data, but increasingly when you install a new app on your phone, you get, you're asked if you want location data to be transmitted or only when the app is in use. And so because the data now come only when a particular app is in use, it's harder to, to put it all together, but we'll talk um, more about that. Um, so there you go. That's what I was saying. Individual trip data, aggregate trip data, location data. I'll show some comparisons next for how these um, data pieces compare to each other. And I'll say again that the individual trip data are the best, cleanest, easiest to work with and absolutely the most difficult to obtain. So here's, uh, here's an example. We used um, commercial data provider Quadrant for location data and we used Streetlight for our um, specific trip data aggregated. And what we find is that from both data sources, um, the distribution of trips by neighborhood is very, very similar. So, so this gives us a lot of confidence that, that inferring trips from the location data, which is available information, um, is potentially a, a good source when you can't get the individual trip data. Um, and also, comp so it compares nicely with actual navigation um, output data. So here's um, another comparison. This is the time of day when trips occur. Um, and there are some differences. Um, the line in blue is derived from the location data and the orange line, so the blue dashed line is from location data and the other line, orange, the orange line with the circle markers is um, derived from actual known trips. So very close comparison, um, which, is, is uh, very satisfying um, in terms of, of knowing that you could infer trips from the location data. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the location data because it has an added complexity to it. Um, the source is, um, it's anonymized. Um, we have a device, we have the locations there. Um, we don't know what apps are in play. Um, and then, so here's how we compile these two um, to make them trips. First, some considerations, there has to be enough pings. Um, a ping is just an indication. It's a, it's a point indication that shows a, 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 a geographic location, longitude and latitude with a time stamp. So what is the frequency of pings? Um, how accurate are they? Sometimes a, a GPS um, ping can bounce off a building. So it's not really where you think it is. We're interested in the distance traveled, the inferred or implied speed from the sequence of dots, um, and then how long the trip lasted. So we, we did have some, some criteria. For example, if the implied speed between two spot, two locations, two pings, was more than 130 miles an hour, for example, um, I think that was the threshold that we used. We knew that was impossible, right? Occasionally we had we'd have a location indicated. Um, I think in the first part of this, we had one trip that was the, the distance between the two pings was an implied speed of, I think it was 4,000 miles per hour. So you, you knew that ping had bounced off of a building and it wasn't a real um, data point. So some amount of, cl of cleaning in this regard um, is, is in order first, regardless of whether it's location data or trip data, but in particular location data. So let me just walk you through how we did this. So we take the pings from a particular device, we map them in space. So here they are overlaid on a, on a hypo hypothetical um, set of pings on a hypothetical network. And then because we have a timestamp on them, we can draw a line um, sequentially showing the order of the location um, pings. So then we do some separating. So um, we look at it, we, we decided a 10 minute separation indicated a new trip. A lot of the pings, again, because these are from user apps, you could be showing somebody just walking around their own home, which could be what's happening here in the upper right corner in the yellow. Um, but some of these other trips, so the blue dotted line could be a trip and the red is certainly looking like it is mapping to some extent to the street network. So um, after we do that, then we pull the trip. So pull the trip to the network. 
Um, and so then we can look at it on the underlying street grid. So it's important to understand how we do that. So we developed actually a software um, to do map matching um, and it, it is available on GitHub. The information is there. We can also provide that to you afterwards. Um, and we essentially want there, there is um, off the shelf map matching um, software that could have been used. But what we found is that the, those available um, packages tended to throw away things that they interpreted or that the coders interpreted as noise, which was exactly what we were mostly interested in, which is somebody driving in an otherwise unreasonable pattern looking for a place to park. So what the program does then is it takes a string of data points that are sometimes on a road, sometimes near a road, sometimes near multiple roads, um, and then we pull it to, to the um, to the underlying grid with probability. So here's kind of an, an easier example. The purple dots show the trail of GPS breadcrumbs. And then the dark green line shows, um, whoops, that was not supposed to happen, shows some candidate routes that the trip may have taken, right? So we are able to determine with probability. So the dashed green here we rejected because you would have had to, the driver would have had to travel too fast to get from here to there had they taken this route. And so we understand with probability um, what the, what, where they're likely, to, what route they're likely to have taken. And also we have a, a way of understanding whether we think it's a good match or not. So, um, so we do, after we do the matching, we do look at the likelihood that it's a good trip. And then we also look at shortest path. So here, this is an example um, of a, this is a poor match, right? We couldn't actually figure out because of the erraticness in the, in the pinging, what was happening, what path this driver actually took. And so um, we, this is a trip that we actually wound up discarding. This trip on the other hand is, is obviously a cruising trip. So the person's entering the frame here they drive around here, we think they drove this way, they circle around this parking lot, they come back down, they drive around back up again, and then they eventually end the trip over there in the, in the corner of the map. So that is a clear um, cruising trip, right? So just um, a quick reminder, this is a slide I showed um, earlier. We say if somebody's trip is, is 200 meters greater than the shortest path and the, the dotted, uh, Blue purple line here is the shortest path and the pink that the, the path that they actually um, traveled. So, so using the map matching is how we're able to do that kind of comparison. So now um, I think we're getting to what um, sort of the applications are here. It could be, I think it's probably the more interesting part for everybody. Um, what policy issues can we address, right? Well, we can look at where cruising occurs. We can see what time of day it is. And then we can, um, these are just three examples. We can um, look at whether or not a particular policy in intervention was successful or not. So here's a nice illustration of how we map where cruising occurred in San Francisco. And this was based on disaggregate trip data. And um, so, so you can see that where the hot spots are, are the, are the very dark burns. And what surprised us is that in this case, there was not a lot of cruising in the main downtown area. And these outlined areas here are showing where the SF Park um, pilot neighborhoods were that, that Alan was talking about at the very beginning. So with the aggregated trip data that we were able to get um, a hold of later on, we here the trip ends are aggregated um, to census block groups. So we can do a different level of analysis there. Um, so, so what we're showing here, the, the blue dots in this picture, so the, the darker burn is more cruising by census um, block group. The, the blues are metro rail stations and the, these other, the lighter blues are, um, are the arenas in Washington, D.C. So we decided for this example, we wanted to see if we could discern a different level of cruising around different um, kinds of, of geographies. So also we can see here um, what time people are cruising. Um, this is a Seattle example. Um, the orange line shows the frequency or the distribution of trips being made. And the dotted blue line is showing the frequency of cruising trips. And you see there's a little bit of a lag 
um, the cruising trips are occurring after the peaks, for example. And that makes sense because these people arrived and then they parked up all the space. So the people who came later didn't have anywhere to park. So that's where you're seeing um, more cruising. I mean, you're seeing the cruising as well here, but, but that's where it's not matching with the trip distribution frequencies. Um, the afternoon is always interesting. We think there's a little bit of a shift change going on. The people who are coming to work in the evening or, or running errands in the evening or dining in the evening are overlapping with the daytime folks who haven't um, left just yet. So another thing you could look at whether your intervention worked or not. Um, this um, image shows two San Francisco neighborhoods. The gray area shows the hours that the meters are in effect. Um, the lines that you see, I'll just focus on the bottom one because it's clearer. Um, this is the average number of blocks cruised throughout the day. And you see that when the meters are turned off at 6 p.m., you have a huge um, spike. So this, as far as a policy intervention goes, you're seeing that the, the meters on are likely helping cruising um, reduction. Um, this, is, this other line shows the rate at which people are coming to that block. Right. And so here you might decide, oh, as a policy intervention, I probably want to extend my meters and then do the same comparison and see and see whether it's working or not to do what you need to do there. So um, then in terms of summarize, so I showed the mapping in terms of summarizing findings um, across some of the cities we've looked at in Seattle at 7% of trips, Washington, D.C., 6% of trips, San Francisco is about 6% of trips, and Ann Arbor we looked at is 3 to 4% of trips. Um, this is very different from the off-site at 30% of traffic that's circling for parking um, that, that Alan noted also right at the beginning. Uh, we did look at San Francisco and Ann Arbor also to to um, determine what percentage of VMT. So, so these numbers show which trips, what percentage of trips have some amount of cruising. Um, and it turns out that cruising for parking in San Francisco and Ann Arbor, the cases we looked at is about 1% or less than 1% of VMT. Um, so then we could do a drill down. So here's in DC, um, as I said in the previous slide, the overall cruising level is pretty low at 6%. Um, what we did find, though, is that cruising can go up to as much as 9% of trips near the stadiums on event days. And also, we saw cruising of it around 9% of trips are cruising for parking um, around the metro rail stations, which, if you're not careful, you could think that that means that, you know, train stations cause cruising, but we didn't control for the density of destinations. So that result needs to be interpreted with, with obviously, a fair amount of care. So there's a range of applications. Um, some of the ones I just discussed, these are ones we have tested or are in the process of testing. Um, I didn't give the results for this, but we've looked at before and after meter price changes, the meters on versus meters off, which I showed, time of day differences, um, geographic differences, which I showed. And um, the, the last one longitudinally, right now we're in the process of trying to analyze cruising in Chicago and we have three years of June data. So we'll be looking longitudinally to see how cruising has changed in that city. Um, so uh, I'd like to just check in with you guys again for a minute now um, and understand how likely you think you, you or your organization would be to use the cruise detector. All right, and now we have a follow-up on that um, also, which is what are your concerns? Can we have another question? Yeah, so why, um, why might you not, or what concerns would you have about using it? And I just sort of peeked in the chat and I saw one of the questions was how much it costs. And we're doing everything to make it free, um, except for the, the input data is is expensive and so so that's the so there's the question there
I'm curious to know how many people don't think cruising is a problem. 10%, that's awesome. Lack of funding, great. Okay, good. It's good for us to have this kind of, of information. Um, privacy challenges in the chat. We'll talk about all of those issues in the discussion. And so what I'd like to do now, um, thanks for, for those thoughts, is I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Tayo, Tayo to talk about um, the, the non-GPS dependent piece. It's non-GPS dependent from your side, not from ours. Um, but so there it is. Uh, Tayo, please take it away. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so um, a lot of what Rachel has addressed earlier on is heavy on the GPS. And so we're thinking, wouldn't it be cool to have like a complementary approach that is light or just totally free of GPS data? So that's the acronym for this GPS independent cruising estimator. Um, and the primary objective is, is can we estimate the, pro the problem of, of cruising in the absence of GPS data. So one of the, uh, one of the uh, reasons that Rachel Aaron is, they may just not exist. Uh, they could be expensive. And for these, for this kind of data, uh, obsolescence tends to creep in quickly, which makes them also more expensive. Because like, you gotta keep gathering them. And so um, can we kind of scale those orders uh, able to get to a regime where one could still get some very good insights on cruising without the need to rely on GPS data. So that's the rationale behind this. And it really heartens me looking in terms of the poll conducted earlier that close to 40% of the folks on these uh, meeting are from, from cities. And that 70% have given serious thought in terms of implementing cruising, you know, although only 7% have done something about it. That's kind of an odd of difference. And so, Will using this tool in some form help to bridge that gap? Um, I, I mean, I think um, I, I think that would be um, a decent value added. So this is what we're thinking. Number one, what kind of data sources can we use as a really good proxy in the absence of GPS data? You know? And then what kind of considerations would be relevant for the choices of this data? Um, so one of the few things we've, we've been given thought to is how cities could pick this tool and use it. Um, even cities that are having challenges, maybe in terms of fiscal um, um, issues. So uh, the cost is really crucial. The ease of access is, is, is kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it is another. Um, are these data collected nationwide? I think that is really, really key. Um, do they have predictive powers? Uh, you know, uh, And then finally, maybe the frequency to which this data are gathered. So just to kind of test the waters um, with three cities, where what we did was, Essentially, we just appended the data set uh, to have much more degrees of freedoms to work with Seattle, Washington, DC, and um, Atlanta. And these analyses were carried out at the census block group level. So less than a track, but bigger compared to like a census block to see what probability at, at some time, you know, that you could see some traces of cruising there. And so the way we kind of well, uh, 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 work with these uh, 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 kind of data analysis, analysis is to take a look at cruising purely in a numeric sense, based in terms of how Rachel explained, we, we kind of define it. That's the excess that was observed. And the other one is to kind of frame cruise in terms of a recoverable. We have a threshold, uh, for example, it was 250 meters. It could have been there is no cruising. If it's less than 250 meters, a, a level one type cruising. If it's more than 250 meters, a level two cruising. So we have zero, one, two as categorical variables. Those will be the dependent variables. Now regress again, some degrees of covariates or explanatory variables. Uh, one is the trip end. What, what hour of the day did the trip end? The average hour of the traffic for this six census block group, the population and job density. Is it during the week? Did the trip happen during? A normal weekday or the weekend, so that's kind of a dummy, and then the policy, variable, policy variables. The policy variables could be whether the meters, the packet meters were, were up and running, or whether they were decommissioned with the time when we carried out the analysis. And finally, we use a regression for general regression neural network methods uh, to kind of have some sense in terms of uh, what 
taken up uh, with the analysis. Next slide, please. So this is still fairly exploratory, um, but there are some few things that we're learning quickly here. Um, that oftentimes what really determines our ability to be able to pick these effects up tend to be localized, you know, not in terms of space, but time. Uh, is there an event going on? Um, is the weather lousy? Something along those lines. Um, and that it tends to be fairly difficult if the, if the independent variables are high rigid. So I mentioned AADT in the previous slide, and it looks as if oftentimes one has better prediction when one uses the imaginal variable compared to averages. So that's some of the challenges that we are running um, into. Um, in 20, during the um, earlier days of the COVID, um, March, April, and some parts of May, um, we were able to work with some of these policy variables. So classic example, the packet meters were decommissioned. And what we observe even runs contrary to maybe what conventional wisdom will dictate. We observe increasing um, even when the packet meters were decommissioned. And we had a very, fairly decent fit in terms of the accuracy figure, 87%. We ran the completion matrix where we separated the cruising from when there is no cruising. You know, we observed that it was making much more noise for those limited observations where they were cruising. Yeah. And so these 7% figure inflates the goodness of faith, particularly in instances when we want to be mindful that cruising may really be a core, and maybe you want to put some uh, maybe like um, interventions or some policies in place. So, um, and then I think I'll move to the next slide. Yeah, so now um, maybe you guys can let us know um, how much more appealing the GIS tool would be than the GPS detector. How likely do you think your organization would be to use GIS? Um, and from there, I think um, let's uh, open it up to some discussion. Um, Alice has been uh, monitoring the chat and the Q&A, and so I'm going to uh, toss it to him to see if there is uh, anything that we should address first, second, and third. So let us know what's, what the thinking is. Um, great. So. Um been getting some great questions. Um, so not really knowing where to start, but we'll start with um, a question from uh, Melissa that I was unable to answer myself. So um, uh, she writes, interesting. So your overlay of where cruising appears to be happening in San Francisco shows areas different than where SF Park piloted their pricing program. Is that correct? Had these data been available, would the goal be San Francisco trying to pilot in those other areas? So one thing that we don't know is um, what cruising looked like in those areas before the SF Park Pilots program. So it's, it's conceivable that had we looked at that slice of time that we would have seen that's where the cruising was. But one thing, and, and, we, and we know um, by other sources that, that, there, that there was parking search going on in those areas. Um, but the, the thing that was, um, interesting in that particular case was that a lot of the parking search is going on in areas um, of tourist destination. So, so, so that adds its own interesting, potentially interesting wrinkle. Um, another question related to the, the San Francisco um, study. So what is the date range for the San Francisco meter data used in the cruising analysis? What is the date range? Um, we looked at, that's a good question and I don't know. Um, San Francisco was, um, we looked at San Francisco as proof of concept before we started. The, the current phase of this work is to, is to bring the, the project and product um, publicly. Um, Alan, maybe you have a, a recollection. I, I can look at it, it's, it's around the 2007 timeframe I'm thinking. Um, is it that long ago? No. I can Google it. It was it was during the uh, urban. We had a the urban partnership program. 
Right, but I think our analysis is more. It, might, it may have been later. That, that may have been actually when we started up, but but yes. I, I That's imagine. right. I, I think that analysis is is closer to 2014 or 2015. Okay. Yeah, I, I could be wrong. Sorry. Um, let's see. So we had a question about um, uh, um, Lord Ellis in the chat was wondering if um, our definition of cruising is fully representative. For example, vehicle operators at slow travel speeds uh, while searching, uh, but don't necessarily circle. So uh, how did um, how did uh, come up with the definition of cruising? Yeah, that, that's so. That's a nice question. Um, we actually had access in the again in the concept development phase um, to a database that's the Ann Arbor data where we had onboard video in addition to um, the GPS breadcrumb data, and we sought to um, match. We tried to look for a signature speed, right? So our signature um, element that we could detect um, by machine learning that mapped to, because you could see when somebody's sitting in their car driving and they're all of a sudden they're, you know, doing all these things looking for a parking space. Um, and and we've got a, a paper on that. Um, a lot of this um, research is published um, under the names Weinberger, Millard, Boyle, and Hampshire. And um, anything specific that I mention, um, we can get. I'll get the actual citation information um, to you. Um, so it's harder if somebody is just doing the straight line cruise. It's harder to detect that one. Um, uh, but we also have other research that shows in a difficult parking neighborhood, that person may easily stop short of their destination. And so um, restricted parking might not lead to excess travel. It could actually lead to, to less travel. Um, but if that person drove a long way and then made a U-turn and came back and parked somewhere, then that is detectable um, by, the, by, the, by the computer. The system does detect that. So, um, uh, here again in the questions, um, uh, noted one big caveat in California is the fact that cars with disabled placards can park all day for free. Our experience in LA is that placard users account for 40 to 50 percent of occupancy in high density areas. In addition to causing spaces to be unavailable, we observe that this abuse increases as we increase the hourly rate. What can uh, FHWA do to help us change state law? Um, and, and I'll also add my own comment on that too um, after after Alan uh, takes that. Um, okay, go ahead. You can. You can oh, so, 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 so I think I, um, what does uh, um, what what can the occupant you know occupancy how does that intersect with uh, with cruising? Yeah. Sure. So uh, rarely does I won't say it's never happened that the federal government is is involve themselves with state law, but it's quite rare. I, I think the role that we typically have is providing information to folks as to what's going on and helping them make their own determinations. The specifics of that, that is a California law. It's, it's not every, every other state has that law that requires uh, uh, disabled permits, as I understand it, and so the localities don't have any control over that. I believe it's Michigan and or Wisconsin has a very restrictive rule for getting uh, disabled permits. And that is you physically have to not be capable, physically capable of using a normal meter. And, and those rules have cut down the number of permits that are available very, very significantly. The other thing that you'll see in that space is that um, in Washington, D.C., they have meters specific for the disabled community. So the idea of disabled parking isn't that disabled folks get to park for free. It's just that the parking is available and it's more convenient and priority locations. And so you don't have to make that parking uh, free if, if uh, you don't want to, but California, as a matter of policy, does do that. I, I will make one uh, other general comment. When you put all this stuff together, one of the things that you see is you're not always seeing cruising where you would expect it. Uh, and you find a lot of nuances in cruising. And, and it, we, we didn't focus on that in this presentation because we really wanted to realize that people, this particular assess that you all might be interested in sort of figuring out where the cruising is happening in your own area. And so we've got more in the, the data here. But it is interesting to, to, to note 
that we see um, a lot of cruising in this uh, in scenario, uh, chat. We often see a lot, a lot in residential neighborhoods. Um, Rachel had some slide up to show that it isn't when the meters are on, but rather when the meters are off that you're seeing sometimes the most amount of cruising. And it, I think it goes up a lot even before the meter goes off because it's still a very good deal. At, at 5.30, if the meter goes off at six, you get put in 30 minutes of parking, even if it's an elevated rate and then the meter cuts off, that's a pretty good deal if you need parking for the rest of the night. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, I guess those were the, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, and, and maybe for a last question, since we only have a few minutes left, I think um, Rachel looks like you typed an answer, but I, but I think it's a good question um, from, from Melissa McMahon. Um, would you say that based on your findings that cruising is less a contributor to total area traffic than often thought, um, that uh, you would use these tools to help focus policy interventions in smaller geographic areas where it could be more influential? So, so short answer is yes, um, we conclude it's less of a problem than has been advertised, um, but that doesn't mean it isn't a problem. Um, and there's, there's obviously a very big public relations problem in any case. And part of that too is the, is the question I tried to hit on early on, which is this expectation that parking should be available right at the front door of, of where you're ultimately going. Um, our ambition for this project, um, which we may or may not realize the jury is still out, is um, that you should be able to look in any geography at any time of day at any scale and understand um, what, what the situation is that you're trying to deal with so that you can implement much more targeted um, interventions. So I see Kenny's come back on and we're at the two minute mark. So do we want to try to squeeze in one more question or should we uh, let you wrap? I think that was the last question, so I think we should start there. Rachel, is, it is it possible just to put the last slide up? I don't know if that appears. Oh, yes, of course. I'm so sorry. I need Thank to you. share that screen. Yeah, that's just if you want to contact the study team specifically. And, and Kenny, also, if, if there's things that uh, <laughs> I was trying to keep up to, and I know Ellis is doing a yeoman's work, but and then some uh, questions came in sort of very near the end. So. Uh, well, we're, we're happy to further engage. We, it's actually what we like to do the most. We learn a tremendous amount uh, from engaging with folks who are thinking about it. So I, I appreciate that. And we're, we're certainly not going to leave it all away. So, Kenny? Thank you, Alan, and thank you, everybody, uh, team. Uh, great presentation. Lots of questions still coming in. Um, so, yeah, get that get that information to me or Alan, and we will uh, try to get you some answers. Um, at this time, we must conclude today's program. A special thank you to everyone uh, from the Federal Highway Administration. Everybody, please take a minute or two to provide feedback by following the link in our chat to our webinar survey. We appreciate the feedback. <clears throat> we look forward to having you joining us for our IP IPMI March webinar, No Parking Without a Plan, Planning for Successful Tech Implement Implementation, presented by Nick Mazanga, PE, Parking Technology Consultant, Kimley Horn, and Matthew Valera, Director of Municipal Sales at FL Market PGS. Thank you for joining us today. This concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>